All right, so we're going to talk to you guys today about making a backwards debugger for Mac OS, or at least more specifically the adventures in doing so. Uh, before we get started, uh, Nick and I both work at Google. We work on the security endpoints agents team. We are not here in any Google official capacity, so much like every time you turn on a video and you see the FBI warning, we would like to say that you know our views, everything else does not come in any official capacity. Um, so this is just us on the side. Legal check. All right. The other thing is before we go any further, the elephant in the room that I've been getting on Slack and other things, this talk is again, it's about our attempt at constructing a record replay debugger and the challenges and experiments and everything we did along the way. We are not releasing a tool today. The effort is ongoing. We have many pieces assembled, but it's definitely not ready for consumption yet, All right? Uh, another good analogy I would say for the talk is this is this talk is going to be like a Roomba in a room We are going to slam into a lot of walls. We are going to pivot the good news is I can promise you there's a light at the end of that tunnel So again, why are we doing this? The short answer is in my day job. I ended up creating some really crazy bugs the biggest one that started and we debugged around January was we'd created a dangling stack pointer in a timer based callback which would fire a single one or zero into another thread. So if you hit the timer exactly right, you could not cancel the thread. It got scheduled in. The dangling pointer would just write a zero or one into the, the, like the thread that came back and occupied that same address space again. This would result in completely insane bugs. We had crash reports that were like, print F of this constant string is like seg faulting, right? You go back into the code, you're like, wait, what? That, this is not possible. How are we here? And so the first thing we did is we turned to each other. We said, well, if we had RR on Linux, we would just record a trace of this if we could finally get it. And then we'd go back and play through it until we found where it was. And so we looked around, and we looked at all the, the prior art, because you know, RR does not work on Mac. And this is a really old idea. This is you know, revert, and the e revert isn't even the oldest one. Right, goes all the way back, you know, to 1999. Like, I was looking through some old slides and stuff, and like, flash the flashback talk. I was in that Usenix presentation in 2004 as a college student. So this has been going on for a while, and we looked around and we looked around. And there's just one problem. None of them talk about Mac OS at all. So there's nothing. There's nothing here. So before we get going, what are we talking about? Basic idea, basically the idea is that like if we can record all the inputs and all the sources of randomness into a process during its execution, put them in a log, we can trap all of that, and if we can then intercept and interpose, we want to run another like execution of that, we can just replay it by running it again and instead reading all of our inputs, all of the randomness, everything else from our log file. And processors should be deterministic enough for us to get the same execution and the same trace as what we got. And if we can do this, then we can you know, set breakpoints, watch points, everything else, and we can triage these really hard to reach things. So specifically, what were we laying out? What, were we, what did we want to do? We only wanted to work on user space programs, because that's what we, the problems we had in front of us were. Um, we need this to be easy to use and deploy, because like, the, field, the issues that I told you about earlier, we were seeing with like, actual user machines in a field, in a place where I can't repro these traces a lot of the times because it's a very, very hard, hard bug to find. Um, but if I can find somebody who is, I would love them to be able to just run this, right? Um, and the other thing is, is that you know, we need to work on stock, you know, a stock MacBook Pro with an M1 or M2. Um, you know, the other thing is we'd like this to work with software that we didn't write, which means, okay, DBI maybe, but not really, but definitely not code instrumentation. Um, the other thing is there's two of us here, uh, right? So we need this to be small effort to maintain. Like if otherwise, the other thing is and that's not just like now, it's over time as well. So if things are changing like syscalls and other stuff, and we have to do a lot of data entry and annotation, it's gonna be a non-starter and the tool won't actually work. And then finally, the last requirement we have is it needs to be fast enough to work on like real programs, right? We don't want this to work on like, you know, my hello world that I've pr done over here, right? Like I shouldn't be talking to you if that's all we did, you can do. Um, but, you know, we have to make it go. 
So looking at this again, RR was like sort of the thing, like another way you can look at this talk is as like a love letter to RR. Um, you know, and we said, okay, what are the requirements? And they, they pretty clearly lay out a few things, right? In their paper, they have this whole, you know, hardware and OS design requirements for what you need to do to be able to do this. You need to be able to record syscalls. You need to be able to record syscalls, you know, ideally if they happen outside of libc. Um, you need to be able to determine if a syscall is blocking, and we'll explain more about that later. You need to be able to intercept signals and re replay them at the exact time they were delivered, and other asynchronous events. Um, you need to be able to pin a process to a single core, right? And you need to be able to track, like, so again, this is looking pretty good. Only one, one out of four, not so bad, right? You need to be able to pin a process to a single core, and like, as this is where we start going downhill very quickly, right? We need to be able to trap non-deterministic instructions, right? If you've seen RDTSC or any timestamps or other stuff, these are all inputs to the program that we have to account for. And we need the ability to like, you know, access a reliable and deterministic hardware performance, you know, unit or counter. Again, you'll see right now that we are now going from all, you know, from mostly green, mostly sad Mac. So, all right, Nick. Nick's gonna talk about how we started with recording. So in addition to normal syscalls, as you would get on Linux, we also have a few other things to contend with, right? It's not quite as simple as we had originally said. Um, on Mac, you have mock traps. These are close enough to syscalls. It's not really a big deal, um, except there's a few traps which don't have normal hook points. They're specifically fast pathed in the kernel, things like get time, for instance. You also have signals, right? You have kind of asynchronous events that come from outside of the target. So signals are kind of the obvious case. There's a few other things on Mac, but we'll kind of group those all together. You have mmapped files, right? Which can either change out from under you or can make writes to a file kind of transparent depending on where you're actually hooking. You have multi-threading, of course, right? Especially on Mac a lot of things have multiple threads running. Well-formed programs shouldn't really have data races, but, um, well, one, we can't guarantee that, uh, and two, that's sort of what we're trying to debug. So, and we don't have an easy way to solve this because, as Pete just said, we don't have CPU set. We don't have a way to pin to a core. There's also the COM page, uh, which if you're familiar with the VDSO or VVAR on Linux, it's sort of the same thing. It's a special page that the kernel maps in that you can just directly read out of, again, for things like get time um, and similar. And then again, we have these non-deterministic instructions. Uh, this MRS is reading from a counter, right? So this is a hardware intrinsic. There's a CPU ID-ish equivalent to. So, Kind of, let's start breaking these down. So for syscalls and traps, right, again, we have normal BSD syscalls, we have mock traps, and there's also a third class of machine-dependent syscalls on macOS. And for all of these, we need pre- and post-hooks so we can gather whatever data we need to record, right? In the case of a pre-hook, we, we may need to walk memory or pull uh, a non-trivial structure out of memory so that we know how to replay and where to replay data to. And then, of course, we need the post hooks to know what the kernel actually put down so we can put it down and replay. Um, on Linux, again, the normal way you do this is with ptrace. It's basically built for this. Um, but Apple com has completely gutted the ptrace implementation on XNU, and it's always been like this. This is not a, a recent development. There's also no set comp equivalent, which you could also use on Linux to do similar things. Um, and so we're left basically with no equivalent way to intercept any of these things blocking to another user land program. We have one sort of option though, which is dtrace. Dtrace is a way for you to push hooks um, and a little bit of logic into the kernel uh, at pre-specified points to say, you know, gather this uh, argument and record it so I can later grab it. 
uh, or go fetch the memory at this address. The issue, though, is that there's not really enough uh, in the dtrace language uh, to capture arbitrary syscall data. You can't branch, um, and there's you, you, it, it's limited. You know, I think you can kind of multiple dereference through memory, um, but again, the, just there not being any type of conditional branching means we can't really record anything that's like an ioctal, for example, where you actually dispatch based off of an inner argument. Dtrace is also strictly asynchronous. Um, so we can't, well one, we actually can't get a pre-hook out of this because, well, so you sort of can, but the issue is Dtrace doesn't give you an easy way to actually get notified when that happens, right? So the best you can do is sit there basically spinning, pulling on the ring buffer that it outputs to until you see something. It can sort of pause the target, so we're like half okay there. It can either send a sig stop or send a task suspend, but those only take effect after the syscall is processed. So this is what I was saying when we don't really have a way to get prehook. If we could stop the process before the syscall, we could then go do whatever memory lookups we need, let it run the syscall, get it paused again afterwards, and go and fetch memory again, whatever we need. So we're already not on a great spot. And to make matters worse, Dtrace on recent systems, at least, has a nasty habit of panicking the system. Um, this is a like sort of known regression, but it's, it's not a good look. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and yes, you also have to turn off SIP to be able to use it. So we're, again, sort of sliding away from the ease of use criteria that we had. There's another option uh, where we could use the sandbox framework, sort of, um, right? There's this seatbelt layer, uh, which is supposed to be and is wired up into basically every syscall, right, as a, a gating authorization layer. There is a trace mode for recording, but there's no way to configure it, right? You only get the arguments in, as registers, as numbers. You can't really dereference through memory or anything. Um, and there's also not really a way to not kill on replay. We would still have to figure out a different way to actually hook on replay and put down what we need. So this is basically a no-go as well. Lastly, there's interposing. Um, the kind of key insight here is that Mac OS is a BSD, and so the ABI is not syscalls like it is on Linux, it's actually libsystem, which is a dynamically linked library which we can interpose on top of. Um, DYLD, Mac's uh, dynamic linker, actually has a very nice interface for doing this, so you can specifically request you know, the read call in libsystem to interpose on. There's libraries uh, to do this to uh, fishhook from Facebook, I believe. Um, so there's pre-made ways to do this, but we then also don't, we still don't catch direct syscalls, right? It's not that you can't do that, it's just that that's not really the ABI. Um, and Go actually got bitten by this a few years ago because in Go, they try and statically link everything, uh, and so they had inlined all these syscalls, Apple changed all the syscall numbers, and every Go program broke. <laughs> So, any back off to Pete. Yep. All right. So again, like we sort of alluded to earlier, we've got to deal with data races, right? Scheduling is actually another source of like non-determinism for us. We have this problem of if we have two threads running in parallel, we you know we have our classic like this one reads from this, this one after what this one writes. If they're clocked differently, this becomes more complicated, um, right? So effectively, you know, we have a read, read after write, write after write, and then depending upon scheduling and clocking and everything else, we can end up in a totally different state. And so this is something we need to deal with. We know that we have a lot of Mac OS apps that are using Grand Central Dispatch and other things. This is just something we have to account for. So how does RR handle this? Well, they just pin everything to one core. They use like thread affinity, run everything non-parallel, like, and then they end up scheduling and recording the, you know, the choice of what they did, and so they end up doing cooperative scheduling on their own. So they intercept and they schedule on their own. And then if you're wondering, wait a minute, but doesn't that, like, me like, you know, doesn't that change the bug if we're doing this? Uh, the way they get around that is they simply mix up the order on replay. So they, you know, there's a chaos mode you can use. 
Uh, the other thing that has, is a nice benefit of binding everything to the same CPU is that if you have CPU dependent instructions like CPU ID, we know we're going to get the same output out of it because we've bound it to the same core that we recorded during, you know, during record and replay. So can we do this on Mac OS? Well, thread scheduling on Mac OS when you want it to go to a specific processor is not guaranteed. Like we said earlier, there's no CPU set. Uh, can we use thread affinity policy? Not really. If you look through the kernel, you'll get uh, thread bind, which is what would actually do this in XNU. But uh, if you look at the XXX, do not export this to users, right? I'm pretty sure they're not going to let us do this. Uh, and we've tried, right? To make matters worse, if we're talking about a modern MacBook Pro, right? We've got P cores and E cores. Remember what I said earlier about like the clocking is different and that becomes a problem for us. Um, we have control over the QoS, so we can pin a thread to a class of like CPU or processor. So I can say, okay, you know, set everything up as user interactive. Make sure we only go on the P cores. You know, there's four slots usually, like, we'll, or you know, however many. You know, we'll get scheduled to that. But I can't guarantee that you'll be on the same P core, which means we have the problem of any data races or any sort of parallelism here is now a new source of non-determinism, which means we'll record the trace up front, and then if we try to replay it, we'll get scheduled and have something different that will actually happen. The other thing is, I don't know if any of y'all read the old Amit Singh book, like the OSX internals. Like one of the, the things he has is an, like just a basic exercise is let's print out all the processors, right? And one of the next things right after he has you print out the processors, he says, let's shut down the cores. So he takes the last core processor that you have and he just calls processor exit on it. And that temporarily shuts it down and then it won't be actually be used by the scheduler. So what if we just limit ourselves to a single core? Yep. Uh, that doesn't work anymore either. So, all right. So again, I told you we're going to pivot. If we're slamming into walls, we're pivoting. It's the next problem, asynchronous events. Signals and scheduling, right? Uh, we need to be able to like intercept a signal. When the OS tells us to stop or tells us to do something, we need to be able to stop and make sure it happens at the same place, right? Um, this is a extremely hard problem in research. Everybody has like slightly different ways to do it, but like the goal here is we need to be able to say at this point in the, pro in the program's execution, this far into it, this is when we actually do it. So if, again, walking through the diagram here, right? I call sig hub and I want to send it to a process. I need to measure where we are in the program's execution so that when I'm then replaying it, I need a way to then trigger the interrupt and actually get it to go like fire at the same place. If I'm too early, I'll get a different outcome and I'll get non-determinism, right? If it's too early, state may be in a different place. Maybe the signal handler does something. Sig hub is a good one because we read the config, right? Maybe the bug shows up because I read the config to here. Maybe it shows up because I read it later. So again, too early, bad, too late, bad. So we need a way of measuring progress through the system. And we need to be able to use that and then trigger an interrupt at the same time. So again, how does RR do this? Well, they use the performance monitoring units specifically, uh, like, and we know that this works on like M1, the hard, we know the M1 and M2 hardware works because, and I'm always butchering the name, so I apologize up front, it works on Asahi Linux, right? And they, they use the same PMU. Specifically, what they're using is the count of retired conditional branches as their progress indicator. So the idea is, you know, set it to max, or set it, check the count, see where it is at the time that you get the signal, and then, you know, for replay, you simply load the set the counter beforehand and say, okay, now decrement, and when you hit this many branches, like, fire an interrupt to me. And this is great. It's zero overhead. Hardware handles this for you, and you kind of get a thing that you can stop and do. Uh, the problem with this is, again, uh, Mac OS does not have an interface for setting the PMUs. We have like Kperf and the other private frameworks, which lots of folks have reversed. And so we can, you know, we can find counters, we can get this stuff. It's not that bad. As you can see here, um, you know, we've got branches that we're recording. However, again, you'll see sometimes like it's 
not always reliable. You'll have stuff that just goes to zero. And sometimes it's scheduling, sometimes it's other stuff. We haven't fully like taken this apart. But more importantly, there's no way for us to set those interrupts for replay. So we just can't use this. And third, you get panics. So when you start messing with the counters a lot, one of the problems you have to deal with is the fact that hardware is hardware, and sometimes you'll get a delayed interrupt. And when you do, and when you're turning them on and turning them off, you'll get a delayed thing. It'll fire late, and then as a result, there's a panic in the X new kernel that just says, I'm not recording right now. I should not get a hardware interrupt, and so you'll get this. Um, if anyone wants to see me make my Mac go boom after the talk, like come see me. I just don't want to actually like have to start the talk over and present again. Um, so what do we do if we don't have the PMU and we don't ha you know, we don't have access to a PMU? How can we measure progress? And again, using the branch, you know, how many branches retired we already have? This is a super old problem. Um, this paper from 1996 basically proposes rewriting, right? So they they propose sort of a DBI style solution where you burn a general purpose register, you use that as your counter, and then on every time you have a conditional branch that's taken, you just simply add this you know, code in that would say decrement register and branch the handler if zero. So the idea being is that you know, every time you take the branch, you decrement the counter, and then when you get a signal, you say, okay, where's the counter at? When you want to replay, you simply preload the counter with the value of number of branches you want to see taken, and then you just simply jump to your handler, which triggers a breakpoint. And so in your log, you record what is the value of the counter. And then you know, for replay, you simply read it out of your log, set the counter, and go through this. So this is a well-known solution, except it violates our we don't want to have to do a DBI. We don't want to have to do this. So what can we do without? One way we can do this is we can just simply count the number of system calls that we have in between, use that sort of as like a gate between when events happened. Um, we're already hooking this, so why not just keep that count? And the idea would be use that as sort of a course count, and then you know we could then also keep like a high-speed timer or something else that says you know this many instructions. Like the code that you see up there is me writing a very very tight loop to you know to then like basically just decrement a counter that I have off to the side in the thread. And we say, okay, this many instructions, this many subtracts have happened between here and there. And the idea is that you know, if we need to go further, we can single step from either the syscall, if we're close to the syscall, if we're really far from the syscall, we can load this timer up independently, pin it off to, you know, to another side and run it until we get close and kind of do something similar. A third method we could do, which scribe, which is another like, more academic you know, sort of thing that's been around for a while, is we could just Pin and you know pin the signal and say we're not going to deliver it until the next syscall. We're already going to hold on to it. We're not going to interrupt you. We're just going to like hold it there. And the idea there is that because syscalls can be inter or interrupted when a signal is delivered, we know when the signal will be taken in the program. So we can create determinism. The thing is, it's not a hundred percent accurate as to like what would actually happen if we weren't running. Um, and so. I haven't really given you solutions right now, right? I'm in, clearly in the like problem enumeration business. And we look, at this point, we were looking around and we were trying to figure out, has anybody else done anything similar to, the, to what we're trying to do? Um, and that's when we stumbled on Darling. So if you don't know what Darling is, as, as their website says, it is a translation layer that lets you run macOS software on Linux. So that is, that is the high level. The, the like layman's term for this is it is wine for Mac OS apps, right? And it's pretty cool. So they've got a whole custom loader. They're doing everything through interposing at lib system and a lot of duct tape. They have a user land server to translate some of the Mac OS syscalls and like simulate what mock does, right? And you can actually run reasonably complex software on Linux like Xcode through Darling. And so again, Essentially, they just use a custom loader to bootstrap like the actual DYLD into their address space. Um, and then they call back into their hooked lib system kernel for things that need mock traps and callback notifications. They have their user land server. And as you can sort of see from like the data flow, we trap in and out and we simulate things as we need to. Um, you know, and this seems pretty workable. 
Like we're seeing like larger and larger, you know, programs and a lot of command line stuff that's just like able to work this way. So how can we do this? All right. Now I get to deliver the good news. <laughs> so yeah, so warp speed. This is what we're building and is our debugger because everything has to have a good code name. So warp speed is, it, its whole shtick is isolating the target inside of a super lightweight VM with a single core. When that VM hits a syscall, right, that actually traps out to us and we can then proxy the syscall up to the host operating system. Feeds back down. Um, we use, or will be using, both sliding signals and this soft PMU, as we're calling it, to approximate program progression for asynchronous events. And since we're sort of running at this layer, we can also do, do manual thread scheduling, which solves the remaining issue. Um, and it's also worth noting, when I say this, this is not like Mac OS in a VM. This is literally the single process really not even the price, it is the executable running in a VM at EL0 with nothing else. One of the key things that enables all of this is hypervisor.framework, which is a super lightweight framework that Apple introduced, like I think in 10.10, .10, um, for building hypervisors and virtualization. Um, it does as little as possible in the kernel and presents a super clean, simple interface. Um, you create a VM, which basically just makes your process eligible for running virtualization. You map memory into this new address space, and notably you map it you know, from your own. It's not like you get a fresh block of addresses that you then have to write into. You just say map this address in the hypervisor to this address or this physical address in the guest. You create a vCPU, you set registers, and you run. That traps back out to you in user land whenever the VM you know, does a, 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 a supervisor call or a hypervisor call, and then you know, go to five, rinse and repeat. That's it. Um, this may sound vaguely familiar with KVM on Linux, right? but it's even simpler in some ways. So how do we actually drive this VM? Well, we can use a modified version of Darling's loader, uh, which is called MLDR, to map in the target program and DYLD into a virtual address space that we've set up, which basically maps one-to-one -one with the virtual addresses in the hypervisor's uh, address space into the guest. We load in the DYLD shared cache, um, which not to spend too much time on it is just a big bundle of data which uh, all of your common uh, dynamic libraries are shoved into. Um, we set up this kind of one-to-one -one translation and map everything we just loaded into our VM. And then again, we can just receive traps out and forward syscalls as appropriate. Um, this is all based on a project called Hyperpom, which is our like, research fuzzer um, specifically for Apple Silicon, and it's in Rust. And so, of course, we're going to write our stuff in Rust. We're hipsters from Brooklyn. We love that. <laughs> um, and all of this basically gives us perfect control over the execution of the program, even though we don't have any ptrace-like interface for doing any of this normally, right? We only have one virtual core. We can manually schedule in and out our threads. And since this is all a one-to-one -one mapping inside the VM and out, any syscall or any addresses that the guest does or guest uses as part of a syscall will just be valid in our virtual address space when we go to proxy it, so we don't have to do any rewriting or anything like that. So roughly, this is what kind of a syscall looks like, right? The tracy calls gitpid, for example, which uh, does a supervisor call and traps out to us. We can record whatever we need out of memory, right? In this case, it's not really anything, but in a more complicated call, we could traverse memory, do anything. And again, we don't have to do any address translation because it's all just right there for us. We then proxy this into the actual kernel, set up uh, you know, stack, registers, whatever we need. Kernel does its thing, comes back to us. We can then record the exit, exit code, exit registers, changes in memory, and then we can resume the tracy with this new register state. 
So we've got a quick demo here. Uh, there's a lot that's going to happen very quickly, so I think we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. So start recording. This is recording a echo program. So it just reads in a few characters that you'll see here. So I enter hi. And that's, that's it, right? But even in this process, I don't know if you can see the cursor too well, we've gone through almost 300 system calls to get here. Um, this is because DYLD, when it's loading, does a lot of stuff, right? Most of the uh, terminal spam that you're seeing here is just DYLD going, loading, trying to figure out where it is, what it's doing. So once we're done here, we now have a trace file uh, in temp, I believe. And so now we can replay this, again, just with the trace file at a later time, and come back, and you'll notice we've immediately gotten our result even without typing anything, right? Because this has replayed the read syscall and a few others um, to put us back into the exact same state at a later time. Um, now, right, this is obviously a relatively minimal example, but again, we had to go through quite a bit to get there. This is a rough overview of what DYLD is doing, at least, again, as it was, a, what, five years ago or so when uh, the, the Levine books came out. So, there's a few unimplemented things, right? Obviously, we want to do more than just a hello world here, but this shows, you know, we have proof of life. Right, we can, the theory is sound, we can actually go through and just you know, write more code now. Um, outstanding things, and the main reason why you know, we're not actually releasing anything today. We obviously want an LDB or a GDB stub or GDB server interface so that you can actually use this under a debugger. Right? It's nice to be able to replay things, but it's even nicer when you can use like our step and our watch to say, tell me, you know, set an R watch on some memory, uh, some address in memory, and go backwards until something wrote that, right? This would have saved us many hours of hair pulling trying to debug that issue from the beginning. We also, of course, need to optimize some of the internals of this. You all probably noticed it took a little bit to get to that hello world. Um, there's a faster version already in the works, but uh, there's many more things to be done on that front. We also have the issue of, well, you know, the hypervisor is responsible for performing the syscalls. So what happens on a blocking call, right? In the case of the read we just did, it works exactly as expected because we're in a single-threaded program and everything's fine. We want that read to block. But let's say you have multiple threads going and there's a mutex wait. We enter that mutex wait and that other thread, which is, you know, supposed to presumably unlock it at some point, never runs because the hypervisor just entered a blocking call never to come back. So how do we detect which things are blocking? Well, we can either manually enumerate them uh, and perform some non-blocking alternative, right? Most every blocking call has some way of doing an asynchronous or non, or yeah, some non-blocking call. Um, or we can actually use another nice little feature that the kernel does expose and does work. Does not panic your machine, mostly, we think. Um, so in this demo, uh, and this is going to be even more explaining, so what I've got here is a very simple program on the right, which is using kdebug to monitor for, I believe it's literally the mock block event in the kernel, which, as you might guess, is what the kernel will emit whenever a thread goes into a blocking state. So. What you just saw in that last couple seconds when I typed ls was we got two blocking events. And so what, what, what's really, what you're really seeing is that I typed the, the L, and then the shell immediately, immediately went back into another blocking read. So we got the first event. Then I typed S and we got the second event. So we can use this you know, with a bit more work to actually automatically detect blocking syscalls. And right now the plan if it lets me skip, uh, is to basically bunt every syscall out to a pthread, right, so that the main execution loop isn't blocked. And then whenever we see one of those pthreads having gone into a blocking call, we can actually just swap in a new thread and let it start running on the uh, main execution loop again. 
whenever that comes back out, it'll just be guarded on a mutex until that, uh, you know, the, the VM actually exits again, and then we can swap it back and keep going our way. Um, and it's a fun little thing because, you know, we sort of have to backronym this warp speed now. You know, if you look, we've got this really nice, like, chevron thing, and it looks like we're going really fast to the right, so. There's a couple of outstanding issues, though, that we don't really have answers for. Um, the biggest of which is memory mapped I.O. and other, you know, kind of writes to memory that can easily be detected like this. RR, uh, up until recently, I believe you said, basically took the approach of won't fix for this. So we're not super concerned about that for now, especially because on Mac in particular, right, message passing is a much more common idiom than shared memory. Um, and then we also have entitlements, which is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, a number of features on Mac OS and iOS are gated behind some entitlement that you have to generally go to Apple and request um, that enables some part or some access of the, uh, into the operating system. We don't really have an answer for that, right? Because we can't just magically subsume the entitlements of whatever we're running that would sort of defeat the point of entitlements. Um, however, we do have some other nice things where, you know, if we can just get something signed with all of the entitlements, for instance, or if you can be running in a local environment where if you do run into this, you can just disable all, you know, entitlement checks, for example. Um, there are ways, but it's very much an open question. And everything I just talked about, though, of course, that's still only kind of half the battle, right? I demoed replay, but everything else was how do we deal with recording? Luckily, though, the principle on replay is much simpler, right? You can generally just set a breakpoint where something happened in the recording, mimic the side effects, and continue. Um, there's the kind of edge case here where you end up getting say a signal in a hot loop though. And so you end up setting your breakpoint in a super busy area which is trapping back out to you, you know, almost indefinitely until you happen to land on like the right iteration, for example, that you actually got the signal on originally. For this though, again, since we're using that sort of hybrid soft PMU plus sliding, importantly, we can just defer a lot of signals until it's not a problem um, or and or use just a little bit of, um, you know, have a separate counter thread running either inside the VM or on the outside, which can then just stop the VM on a dime whenever it thinks it should be about time and then do the normal breakpoint trickery from there. So that will get us, you know, let's say 95% of the way there um, from our testing. These are the counters are normally about one per, like plus minus one percent per iteration. And then one last point that I know we're going to get asked about, so I just wanted to kind of bring up before. What what about UI, right? How do you deal with graphical programs, given that this is Mac OS and so many things are graphical, right? It's part, of, it's a core part of the operating system. We believe that this will just work, right? Because all of these come into the program in ways that we can intercept, right? Over ports, over signals, whatever the case may be. You won't see the UI on replay, right? Because we're not actually passing any of these events up to the kernel, uh, so, or you know, up to the rest of the system such that you would see any side effects, but you can still, you should be able to still just replay it as normal, right? So if you know what you're looking for or you're, you know, you're dealing with a crash, it's still just as good. Basically, it's a to-do and double check. So to recap, this is tool is very much still a work in progress, right? We have signs of life though. The principles do work. Um, stay posted for more. Hopefully we'll do another talk, you know, in a year or so, and we can be like, here's here's your tool, right? Go go forth and use. Um, but not today. We <laughs> Spent way too many hours getting to where we are. Like we said, it was it was definitely a Roomba running into walls over and over and over. But we we do think we have something here. We have signs of life, um, and yeah. So with that, are there any questions?
So the question is, since you're running on a single core and single process, what about XPC, IPC, and other inter-process communication? So there's a couple of options here, right? Normally, um, if you're recording, you would just have the normal kind of receiver side set up, right? And the recording minus any, say, like authentication checks would just perform, would just be as normal. On replay, since all of those side effects of the underlying mock port that delivered the XPC message were recorded, you won't actually see any of that communication, right? You'll see all the side effects of the communication in your debug session, but you won't actually have to deal with, say, recording or replaying two different processes at once, right? The, the whatever process is interesting to you will be isolated standalone because, again, all of that is just built on mock ports. So since we're recording the underlying mock message uh, trap, we see all of that interaction, we record all of that interaction. So on replay, it should just work. Yeah, so, so we're only recording one single process at a time, right? Um, but again, like, the, the thought is you're only interested in recording and debugging one process, even if it's out of a stack of different things, all of XPC communicating, there's still generally only going to be one to, like, to actually, yeah, deal with. All right, three, two, one. All right, that's it then. Thank you.